Good morning. I'm Pastor Mike Brink from Park Avenue Baptist Church, and I'm so glad you've chosen to spend this time with us. We at Park Ave want to be of help to you, so if you have a prayer request or want to chat about today's sermon, fill out the connection card in the comments section below. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you for being with us, and we hope you enjoy today's service. Good morning, and thank you for being with us today. We are in week three of our four-week series, One Nation Under God, because a king and a kingdom is better than a candidate. Um, I want to remind you of some truths that we've discovered during our first two weeks together. I'm going to go through these quickly so we can get to some new content today. Uh, first of all, uh, we need to be a people who speak out compassionately while others freak out. Uh, that's part of our calling uh, that we help to bring calm to the chaos, not just amp the chaos up a little bit further. Uh, we've talked about this idea that I'm an American for now and a heavenly ambassador for now, and both of those are limited time offers. I will not be an American forever. I will not be a heavenly ambassador forever. Uh, I will be a heavenly citizen forever uh, because I know Jesus Christ is my personal savior. Uh, we talked about this idea last week that who influences you more, God or culture? And we know which one should be our answer, uh, but it's not always an honest answer for us. Uh, we looked at the life of Daniel and how he chose to uh, be more influenced by God than by the foreign culture that he found himself in. And that uh, the astonishing reality that Daniel 1 comes before the rest of the book and that the choices Daniel made in Daniel 1 made possible all the events of the rest of the book. And if he had not chosen as wisely, if he had not been as determined to obey God, uh, there's a whole lot else that would not likely have happened. And uh, in the same way, we don't know how the seemingly small choices that we make today can impact the rest of our lives. Uh, when it comes to us, Satan has a very effective strategy, but it does not have to be effective. He says, I will immerse them in worldly culture and drown out their ambassadorial priorities. And it works far too often, but it doesn't have to. Uh, we are called as representatives. Uh, we can be reminded together that I am an American for now, but I am a child of God forever. And that's key for us to remember. And we also used some scripture out of Psalm 139 last week that I'd like to uh, use to help frame our journey going forward. And those final two verses of that chapter, this prayer of David, says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. Well, this week we want to move into some new territory and I think some very important territory for us. Uh, I'd like to start with this reality that the devil deals in deception, destruction, distraction, division, and death. Uh, these are all tools and priorities that Satan has as he uh, seeks to trip us up to disrupt what God wants to do in our lives. And the one I want to zero in on this week, although several of the others come into play, is that idea of division. Now, our logic can get pretty twisted up, and I think it ends up happening a little bit like this. Uh, see if this seems at all familiar to you. First of all, we think, well, the way I think is correct. Second of all, we think, well, God agrees with me. And then third, we think, if you don't agree with me, then you don't agree with God either, and you must be wrong. Sound at all familiar? We probably don't state it that blatantly, but that's a lot of our mental process that we go through. 
So I want to go down through and I want to challenge some things here for us just to pry open our thinking maybe a little bit. This first idea, the way I think is correct. I want to challenge that because the way I think is often wrong, even when it feels right. Um, the way that I think, the way that I feel, they are not reliable barometers for how I should live. Secondly, what I decide is true is often based on what I want to do. Um, that's, just, that's not comfortable for us. We don't like that reality. But the reality is this. When I've decided I want to do any, something, I will twist truth around in order to justify what I want to do. And that's a dangerous thing about us as human beings. The second reality that we looked at there, or the step in our twisted logic, is the idea that, well, God agrees with me. And often we treat God like he's our buddy, or like he's our indentured servant, but not like he is one with power and authority. In other words, we claim that God agrees with us, but rarely do we have a mindset of, I will choose to agree with God based on what he says, what his word reveals about who he is. I choose to agree with God. No, we claim God on our team. And it's, it's a scary thing for us. Also, we tend to assign our opinion to God rather than seeking what he says and living in light of that. In other words, we decide what we want and we just go, God agrees with me. Um, he must, because he's, he's a smart God. So of course he would agree with me. And it's a dangerous thing. Uh, we move from there into this third area. Uh, if you don't agree with me, then you don't agree with God either, and you must be wrong. And we just want to challenge us that we often ignore absolutes where they do exist. And we often create absolutes where they don't exist. In other words, where God has said, thus saith the Lord, we'll often turn away from that and go, well, that seems so harsh. That seems so archaic. That seems so backwards in its thinking. It seems so constrictive and limiting. But then we will create absolutes where God didn't place one. And we will express a staunch opinion that has a very tenuous basis in God's word. But we will preach it and proclaim it like it is gospel truth. And we need to be careful. Now, we're hearing plenty of talk around the issues in politics today. Uh, we're not going to go in depth here, but some of these ideas that, that you see on the screen are probably very, very familiar. Uh, the reality is this. These are complicated issues. Some more complicated than others. And we deal with so much information, but do so little listening and so little learning that we just get settled into the opinion that we have. And it's very easy for us to vilify anyone who holds a different opinion. I think as believers, we need to be careful there. Um, so I want to challenge us with a few more things that you may find uncomfortable, and that's okay. Uh, first of all, as Christians, we don't all view these issues the same way. Do you realize that? We don't support all of the same policies. We have some similarities, and we have other issues on which we would find great variety of opinion. One more. We don't all support the same political party or the same candidates. And this is one of those areas where, where we can go, well, obviously I'm right. I'm seeing the issues clearly. And anyone who isn't seeing it the way I see it, well, they're wrong. They're in opposition to me, but obviously they're also in opposition to God. And I think we need to be careful. We're doing a lot of damage. 
I want to remind us real quick of who our enemy isn't. And we get this mixed up. Uh, our enemy is not the opposite party. Our enemy isn't the candidate that I, that I don't like. Our enemy isn't the people whose opinion differs from mine. And my enemy especially is not Christians whose opinions differ from mine. Because can I tell you something? Sometimes we go, well, if they don't see this the same way I see this, then I don't even think they're saved. I don't even think they know God. Because if they did, of course, they would agree with me on all of these issues. So who is our enemy? We know this. This is no grand reveal, but we forget that our enemy is Satan. He is a deceiver. He is a divider. He is a distorter. And too often, we just plain fall for it. Well, I want to take some time today. We're going to look at some select verses from John chapter 17. The whole of that chapter is a prayer of Jesus. Uh, very shortly before his arrest, his trial, and his crucifixion. And we don't have a lot of recorded prayers of Jesus. We have a lot of recorded teachings, but really only a handful of prayers. And there are some, like the Lord's Prayer, that we tend to go to a lot. And there are other prayers, like this one, that I don't know that they get the attention they deserve. So I would suggest that when Jesus prays, we should pay close attention. What does it reveal to us about him? What does it reveal to us about his priorities? And what does it reveal about how he prayed? Uh, I want to start actually toward the end of the passage because there's something really, really important there that helps to frame everything else we're going to look at. So I'm going to jump down to John 17, verse 20. He says, I am praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. Guess who that is? Well, if you're listening today and you're a Christ follower, meaning you have accepted the gift of salvation, and you have given him authority in your life. You're depending on him and him alone for eternal life. That this verse is talking about you. Oh, Jesus was praying not just for the disciples that were gathered with him there. He was praying for all true disciples down through all of human history, and that includes you. So, John chapter 17 was Jesus praying for you and for me. And that gives us extra reason to give very close attention to what he has to say here. Now, there's a lot here, and we're going to touch some highlights. I would, again, would encourage you, go back, read down through this entire chapter, and dig in and get in touch with the heart of Jesus. So we're going to start out, and verse 3 is such a crystal clear verse about eternal life, about salvation. It says this, And this is the way to have eternal life, to know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, the one you sent to earth. So what is the way to have eternal life? to know God and to know Jesus. Uh, that type of knowing talks about a relational knowing, not just knowing about, it's not just informational, it's relational. Uh, and I think it's just a wonderfully crystal clear expression there of what eternal life is and how we obtain it. Uh, down in verse nine, he says this, my prayer is not for the world. 
but for those you have given me because they belong to you. So Jesus' prayer was not for uh, all people everywhere. This prayer was focused in on those that belonged to him, those who believed and were depending on him for eternal life. And then a couple verses later, he says, now protect them by the power of your name so that they will be united just as we are. Now, first of all, how united do you think God the Father and God the Son, Jesus Christ, how united do you think they are on a scale of 1 to 10? Yeah, I'm thinking at least 15. Like, they are completely united. They are of one mind, they are of one heart, they are of one priority. And Jesus prays that we would be protected, that God would protect us by the power of his name. Why? So that we would be united. Now, why would Jesus pray that we would be united? Well, it must be that he knew there would be significant threats to our unity. Given the diversity that existed among his original disciples, um, they were different kinds of guys with different kinds of backgrounds. And um, you think we can have some political disagreements. I'm thinking the disciples had the potential to be extremely divided in terms of their political opinions. Jesus knew that our unity would come under siege. He was not surprised by that. He anticipated it. And he prayed for us as a result. Uh, verses 15, 16, and 17 start a flow of thought that I think is really important for us to delve into. I'm not asking you Meaning, God, I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but to keep them safe from the evil one. And so often, we're like, God, take us out. Bring us home. We're so tired of this world. Just get us out of here. And Jesus prayed not that we would be removed, but that we would be protected so we could accomplish the mission he has for us here. Uh, ambassadors go to the people who need to be communicated with. Ambassadors aren't couch potatoes. They don't circle their wagons and stay in the middle. Ambassadors are people who go out and interact with people who need to be reached uh, on behalf of the authority that they serve. And that's the same priority for us. Verse 16, they do not belong to this world any more than I do. That's a great reminder for us when we go, I'm an American for now, but I will not be an American forever. I am a divine ambassador for now, but I will not be an ambassador forever. Uh, there's a sense here, a good reminder for us that when we are thinking, man, I just don't feel like I belong. I don't feel like I fit anywhere. It, some of that may be because you are in a place that is not your, really your home. You're not going to belong here. And then lastly, verse 17, make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. As a culture, we are all about finding our own truth, about defining our own truth. And as God's people, we need to be about truth has been given to us. Truth has been imparted to us. And that's why one of the things that we talk about a lot as a church is that we view the Bible as God's word and as the absolute authority for our lives, for how we will choose to live. Uh, that brings us back around to verse 20. We've already talked about this verse, 
But now that we're in the flow of everything that's going on here, it's good for us to review this. I am praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. So Jesus, as he prays these things, is praying for us. I want to move on to verse 21. He says, I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one, as you are in me, Father, and I am in you. And may they be in us, so that the world will believe you sent me. So again, we have a prayer for unity, that they will all be one. What is the basis for this unity? What, is, what does he compare it to? Well, the kind of unity that he has with the Father. The kind of uh, unity that exists there, he prays for us. And he prays so that the world will believe you sent me. Uh, it's part of our testimony, it's part of our reputation that our unity helps convince the world that there's something about this God and there's something about this gospel message that is different because it produces different results. Uh, moving ahead to verse 22, he says, I have given them the glory you gave me so they may be one as we are one. So God, Jesus has equipped us uh, to live out this destiny, this mission that he has given us. Uh, I am in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. That's amazing. Again, may they experience such perfect unity. A recurring theme all throughout this prayer. Why? So that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. It is hard for us to grapple with that as a people, as Christ followers, the Father God lavishes on us the same affection, the same delight that he finds in Jesus Christ. That's a phenomenal thing for us to grapple with. Uh, one more spot that I want to look at, it's actually the final verse of this prayer, verse 26. He says, I have revealed you to them. So, God, I have revealed you to these disciples and I will continue to do so. Now, Jesus didn't have a lot of time left, but he said, I will continue to reveal you, Father God, to these disciples. Then your love for me will be in them, and I will be in them. So there is a tremendous unity that exists between God the Father and God the Son, and Jesus prays and provides a way that we would be right in that mix, right in the smack dab in the middle of that unity, that God the Father and God the Son, they are united, and now their people, the church, will likewise be united. That's an amazing thing. So, in light of what we see here in John 17, I just want to address four core realities for us, for Christ followers here in 2020. What does this mean for us? Well, I have a couple of things that I want us to grapple with just a bit. First of all, Christ followers desperately need each other. That does not come naturally to us. We have a very strong sense of individualism and that I'm on my own. And if the church benefits me, I'll come to church. And if I don't really feel like I need the church, you know, I can take it or leave it. And that's not reality. 
That's an area where we are deceived. Paul did some teaching in Romans 12. I just want to zero in on two verses that help us to understand. He says, just as our bodies have many parts, and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body, and we all belong to each other. There's some radical concepts there in some very uh, easily understood imagery. Uh, we understand that our human body is made up of a variety of parts. They don't all look the same, they don't all work the same, uh, and we need that variety for the body to function. So I just want to tease this out a little bit with a couple of thoughts to help us grapple with this. First of all, we need to acknowledge that we all function differently. Uh, I'm not like you, you're not like me. We have different strengths and we have different weaknesses. And weaknesses are something that other people help compensate in for us. And strengths are areas where not where we draw more attention, it's where I can help someone else. It's a powerful thing for us. Secondly, unity is not the same as uniformity. They are, they are not the same. It doesn't mean we all need to think the same way or function the same way or have all the same views, but we will have unity uh, around the cause of Christ. Uh, there is strength in diversity. And lastly, just to go really, really practical, no one else can do your part. The body needs you. Uh, this unprecedented season of COVID-19 and coronavirus and quarantine has been very, very challenging for the church because for a period of time, we were not able to gather together. And so we watched church online and we felt like, oh, it's just like being at church. And no, it's not. Because it was easy for us to become disconnected from one another, to not be helping one another, to not be checking in on one another, to be able to encourage one another. Just hearing a sermon is not being the church. And no one else can do the part that you do. And so when you remove yourself from us and remove yourself from connection with us, the body is weaker because you're not present. Um, so my challenge to us would be, even if physically you cannot be with us or it's not wise for you to be with us yet, stay connected. Uh, keep interacting with people. The same technology that allows you to be listening to the sermon also allows you to connect with people in powerful ways. Stay connected. Uh, secondly, uh, second of our four core realities that I want us to look at is this. Our primary mission will always stay the same. It doesn't change. Uh, we don't have to, so what we, what's the church supposed to be doing this year? No, the exact same thing the church has been called to do from the beginning. I want to look at familiar verses, Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Jesus gave the Great Commission. He said, therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I just want to pull one really crucial thought uh, from these verses for us. The Great Commission tells us what? Make disciples. And the Great Commission tells us where? All nations. But it doesn't tell us how. Why? Because the how keeps changing. The same methodology is not effective in all cultures and at all points in human history. That changes. Does it change the message of the gospel? No. 
that we are sinners, that Jesus came, that he died, and that salvation is available for any individual who will say, I need what only Jesus can do for me. That never changes. How we communicate that, how we structure, how we function, those things are open to change. And we need to remember that. Third, we need to be for something more than we're against something. And that's something that, as the modern church, I, I think we miss. I think we miss it a lot. That people know what we're opposed to. They can name off all the things that Christians don't like. But if we were to ask them, so what are Christians in favor of? What, what, are they, what do they support? I think there's a lot of people in our world that would be scratching their heads and going, you know what, I really have no idea. They're always making so much noise about what they're angry about. If we stopped all the things that we're, they're angry about, I don't know what the church would do. I think they might close up. They might just dry up and blow away because their entire purpose seems to be opposition. And I, there certainly are things that we need to oppose. But I think far out ahead of that, there need to be some things that we're in favor of, that we promote, that we advocate. Uh, and that's what ambassadors do. They carry forth good news. They help to build relationships. They help to reconcile. And so first and foremost, we're called to be reconciled. Uh, so just a few examples. What are we in favor of? What are we for? What we're for? Dignity for all people. We are for love. And I know that gets twisted around in a lot of different ways. We're allowed to clarify what we mean by that. But we need to be a people characterized by love, by peace, by reconciliation, and by respect for people, even those we disagree with. Uh, we need to have some fours, not just a long list of things we're against. I have one more. Last thing I want to challenge us with is we will be a people who choose to love like Jesus loved. Now, that sounds really good on paper, that lives really hard because Jesus set aside his own rights, his own privileges, what was most convenient and expeditious for him to meet the needs of others. We don't like that idea. Jesus sacrificed. Uh, he gave up his life. And for most of us, we're not even willing to give up our convenience to love somebody else. Um, so this is a huge challenge for us. Jesus himself expressed this so clearly for us. John 13. He said, so now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Well, that sounds pretty simple. It's very easy to understand. It's very difficult for us to live out. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. That verse has always bothered me uh, because I'm like, oh, Jesus, really, do you need to set the bar that high that we have to love like you love? Well, you're the son of God. You have different resources than I do. Not true. As a Christ follower, I've been resourced in every way necessary to live out what God has called me to do. I'm not lacking anything. And then verse 35. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. It's troubling that very often the, the characteristics people would use to describe Jesus are diametrically opposed to the characteristics they would use to describe church people. It ought not to be. Uh, I believe that our world is so tired 
of hearing about God's love because they see so little of it lived out. All they hear is words. All they hear is talk. We need to be people who embody that truth. And lastly, as we look at this entire area of disunity and disagreement, I think we need to remember this. I will not always be right. <gasps> I know, shocking. You won't either. I will not always be right. But I can always choose to be loving. Pretty easy to be loving when I'm winning the argument. Will I choose to be loving when I'm losing the argument? When I'm feeling embarrassed, when I'm feeling like, well, I, I didn't know those facts. How will I respond then? And, and too often, that's when we turn especially ugly. And that's when we need to be able to show the love of Jesus Christ and respond differently than what people expect. I want to close just circling us around to a uh, prevailing theme throughout this entire series for us, and that is this that I am an American for now, and I'm thankful, but I'm a child of God forever. And my identity as a child of God and my assignment as an ambassador has to beat out how I behave solely as an American citizen. The one needs to inform above the other. So we get to say together, I refuse to think that this world is all that matters because this is not the world I was made for. I'm on temporary assignment here. Let's live it out well, church. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your guidance. We thank you for truth. God, I thank you that you are a solid anchor point in a world that is in chaos. God, would you help us not to get caught up in the chaos? Would you help us not to become arrogant people, people who just irritate? But God, would you allow us to be a, a balm to hurting hearts? Would you help us to stand for truth? but do it in the most gracious, loving way we can find. I pray that you be with us this week and in the weeks to come as we encounter people with whom we disagree, people who hold a different opinion, and sometimes those are going to be the same people who are sitting at the other end of the pew. God, would you help us to be kind? Would you help us to love like you loved? And will you help us to find the unity for which you pray? We thank you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for being with us this week. Um, just continue to think on these things and ask God, God, how would you want me to live this out so I can make a difference for you? God bless. <laughs>